Have you ever noticed random service accounts blowing up with authentication requests? Well, this may not be normal network chatter. A sneaky technique known as Kerberosing allows attackers to request service account tickets from Active Directory, slide offline to crack them, and come back with shiny new credentials like normal users. The good news is that these attacks leave artifacts, so on today's episode, we're going to do a walkthrough on how to find those with Windows Event Viewer, Sysmon, and a dash of PowerShell. Welcome to Learn with Hack the Box, a unique YouTube series focused on fast tracking your career in either offensive or defensive cybersecurity. We're actually trying something a little bit different this time around. We're going to do a part one of two video on a particular security event. We're looking at Kerber roasting from a red versus blue team perspective. Not only just the attack itself, but the actual exposure chain so we know how to break it before it breaks us. This ties directly to a human first approach to CTEM or continuous threat exposure management, something we'll talk more about later. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the upcoming episode and get that full purple team experience. So put simply, Kerber roasting is the process where an attacker will try to steal service account credentials through Active Directory by requesting a Kerber roast ticket and then taking it offline to crack it. An attacker requests a service ticket or TGS for a service principal name or SPN. The ticket contains an encrypted blob that only a target service account can decrypt. So if that account uses an RC4 encryption or some sort of weak password, an attacker can take this offline, use a tool like Hashcat, do a brute force, pull the service account plain text password out and then go back into your environment, authenticate and do some sort of lateral movement as that service account. The scary parts are that it can be done from any domain user. It is noisy in a specific pattern and most detection is about pattern recognition rather than a single magic alert. Akira ransomware and other threat actors have to take advantage of these SPNs uh, moving offline to get these service tickets cracked and then moving back into your environment. This is the exposure cascade. And what we basically we're seeing here is it's like a small action leading to large privilege escalation. Um, these service accounts are very important because they control things like your backup tools, your uh, your group scheduled task, uh, you know, all these important things in your environment that once you have that gained privileged access, you can then pivot all the way up to owning a domain. So there's gonna be a few different places where your telemetry is gonna help you out, but I think the best bang for buck is gonna be your event ID 4769 and your security logs. Now, this is where you actually see the Kerberos ticket request taking place. Um, you can also see some cool things like the uh, RC4s. You can see your SPN spikes, uh, any oddities in your events, uh, a user account being used at 2 a.m. Um, just these, these little things paired with detections, of course, uh, allows you to see a lot more when it comes to Kerberos. So a quick fun fact, uh, RC4 actually shows up sometimes as 0x17 in the logs. If you start seeing 0x17 popping off like popcorn, it's a really good time to start your investigation. So after that initial request occurs, we actually see the attacker taking these tickets and they'll take them offline to try to crack them. So we lose a lot of visibility. There's actually a, a beautiful window of opportunity that we can miss out upon. Uh, but let's dig into our lab and see with some Windows built-in tools how we can find some of these artifacts. All right, so to start things off of our lab, let's make this as simple as possible. We're gonna dive into Hack the Box Labs and pivot over to our Sherlock's tabs. Now, once we're over here, we can go into the Campfire. And Campfire is based off of a Kerber Roast attack. This is all from a DFIR perspective, but this is gonna be an easy way to look at these and have all of our artifacts already pre-populated for us. Now, fortunately, these are retired free Sherlock's uh, and they're very easy. So that you'll see the sample size is a little bit smaller and it's a little bit more direct. Uh, but you do have a fictional story here with some items that they kind of solicit from you. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the download files and we're gonna download that zip. Um, so once we've done that, we then need to grab the key next to it. So this is hack the blue. Now we're gonna do is we're gonna take these both into our host or our lab machine. We're going to then uh, uncompress that zip file using that password and then put it into our lab. So I've already went ahead and done that for the sake of brevity. And this is Flare VM. Now, Flare VM is a Windows-based uh, setup for DFIR. You can also use something like Remnux or just a, a, a Ubuntu, whatever your flavor is. Uh, but if you're looking to set up a lab, we actually created a video previously in our series here. Highly recommend it. It's about 30 minutes. It's a little bit of a watch, but we also set up uh, Flare VM, Remnux, as well as like a Splunk instance. So if you wanted a full, you know, sock-like experience, um, this is how you could do it. So anyways, we're gonna dig into our Hack the Box Labs, our uncompressed files are here. And then we're gonna go ahead and open up our first tool and that's gonna be our uh, Windows Event 
viewer. And so we're gonna go ahead and run that with, with uh, system admin priv. And uh, we're gonna dive into those logs. So we're gonna go to the right here, open our save logs. And then we're gonna dig into the domain controller. So uh, the fictional story kind of points this way. And this is kind of how Kerberos attacks go. Uh, but in this instance, we're gonna look at our domain controller uh, logs from our security side. It's gonna prompt us, says it's already there. We're gonna go ahead and override it. And uh, we are now presented with the logs from this domain controller. Now, in this instance, we're looking at uh, about 293 events. Now, this is very uh, conservative. Uh, we're looking at this in the real world. We're looking at like thousands, ten thousands, you know, north. Uh, so there, there's a lot you can kind of go through here, but you're going to just kind of see the, the power of, of going through and filtering these out. So just using the, the Windows tool here, we're going to go through filter current log. And we had previously mentioned that we're gonna look at the window event 4769. So we're gonna pop that in there really quick. And we went from 293 events down to 16, which is considerably easier to go through. Um, in the real world, it may not be that small, but you know, your miles may vary. So what we're gonna do here, just to try to keep it simple and kind of relevant to what we were discussing before, is we are looking at these logs, uh, these, these information events. And because uh, this isn't inherently bad, uh, this is not gonna flag as like critical or like high alert. This is just informational stuff. Hey, a ticket was requested and uh, these are the type of uh, details or information about those events. So we can actually start clicking into these and we can um, just open our window up a smidge. Um, it gives us some information. Uh, I'm just going to poke around here. So a, a, a few we have. Um, and what we're looking at here, we're looking for is just, uh, let me open her up. Perfect. Um, so we're looking at our event logs and just information based off of what has occurred. Uh, so in this instance, we are going to see things like the service name. We are going to see the account name associated to this, um, just what the domain it was on and different types of, of bits. Uh, but one thing we're looking here for this particular instance is additional information under ticket options, encryption types, and failure codes. So we had previously talked about different types of encryption methods. And one we're looking for we're doing our analysis here it kind of sticks out is the 0x17 right here now it's not going to explicitly say what type of encryption it is it shows you the actual type code and then you'd take this to your uh favorite you know open source tool and see what these codes actually mean and in this instance the 0x17 is actually a failed uh encryption attempt uh with parentheses RC4. Uh, so this is gonna be a, a very indicative of what we're looking for in this particular instance um, compared to other um, items here on the account name. We do have DC01, we have administrator, as well as this alpha, uh, Alonzo Spire. Um, so we're, we're not saying this is inherently bad. These are just notes we want to take saying, hey, this particular account name on this particular, you know, service account, uh, service name is using RC4. And this is one thing we can look at when we're trying to do our analysis. Now that's all fine and dandy. What we did is we went through here, we took our 293 events, brought it down to 16. This is very parsable, very doable. But uh, this is again, a perfect sample set, uh, smaller in size. In the real world, you are looking at a lot more. So this is where uh, the power of automation could really help us out. So what I did is I went through and I crafted a very simple uh, PowerShell script. Uh, it's like 16 lines in total. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna point that uh, .evnt, our event log, at this script, the script's gonna point at that, and then we're gonna be able to parse through off of properties that we seem interesting and try to do some quick analysis, uh, bring our triage uh, window down significantly. So what I did here is I'll kind of walk through it. The uh, line two says log path. So what I did is I went through, I set a variable to whenever we right click and go to copy as path, we are looking at that event ID or event uh, log. And so we take that there and then wraps it up as a variable and says, hey, we're gonna do a uh, Windows event, win event uh, against this log path. Then uh, for uh, each object where the object is equal to the property ID of 4769, that's the uh, event ID that we deemed important in this scenario. Uh, for each object in there, we're gonna look at the XML and then parse uh, some of these uh, properties of interest. So we're looking at the time created, the accounts, and then also the SPNs. And then when we take all of that there, we're then gonna sort it all out. Uh, and then I kind of cheated. I, I have the uh, the select object of the last 16 items, because I know we had 16 out of our, uh, our output. So once we do that, we run that, you'll see very quickly that we have our accounts. They're all uh, in that same uh, local, that local there. So we have that for uh, LA. 
Now, that's not exactly 100% helpful. If we had different, um, you know, accounts, it might give us a, a little bit of a spread of different accounts associated to it. But for what we're looking for in our sample size, that's not exactly the greatest. Uh, but what we could do is we can then look at our time created. Now we have to be careful, camel case that, and make sure it's uh, the same spelling. And then we are now given an output of 16 different timestamps. Now where this gets interesting is if you actually look at the bottom half here, and I don't know if I'll be able to highlight it, uh, but all these ones down here are the exact same. Uh, and, and so it's really weird that almost like half of our sample set, they're all the same time frame. Uh, that's, that's an item of concern. We definitely want to look into that and jot that down, but that's not very uh, human-like. Uh, it might be something that's, that's being scripted or automated out there. Uh, and then the last thing we can look at here is uh, swapping that out. We can look at our SPNs. Now, it's one thing to say if you have a couple of short, you know, onesie twosies here and there, but when you have 13 of them, you know, 80% of your entire sample set is one individual, and then half the time frame is, is the exact same time. This is where the pieces start to create a story. So if we wanted to wrap up all these mitigations in a few sentences or two, we're looking at basically having AES enabled Kerberos. We want to have that stronger encryption. When it comes to these service accounts, we want to look at having a couple different things in place, managed service accounts. Uh, the service accounts that we do have, we want to have strong forms of uh, passwords and you know authentication, what have you, making sure that the keys of the castle are nice and secured, and we're disabling that interactive interface. And then lastly, we want to keep an eye on these SPNs, any sort of odd activities associated with that, you know, the admin logging on at 2 a.m. Uh, just we want to keep an eye on that kind of stuff and monitor it for weird activity. Uh, but when it comes to this whole thing, it, it, it's really about a, a full encompass tool set as well as training. And this is where CTEM really comes into play. While on the subject of CTEM, let's talk about this continuous threat exposure management. Uh, so when we're looking at this, we want to take these threat actors, these attack chains, we want to make it into human readiness. We want to take these logical playbooks and use it for something that we can constantly monitor for. If you want to train on these scenarios the same way at a real SOC or DFIR team do, check out the Hack the Box Threat Range. It's a live fire cyber defense simulator designed to measure and strengthen team performance in a safe, structured, gamified environment. And if you want to practice this attack specifically from a hands-on blue team perspective, Sherlock Campfire 1 and Campfire 2 are the exact labs that we use in reference for today's walkthrough. Links in the description, all down below. So as we previously mentioned, this is part one of two in our Red vs. Blue series on Kerber Roasting. Now, if you're curious about that Red Team episode or any of our previous offerings with the Learn with Hack the Box series, you can watch these videos right here. Thank you so much for watching and have a good one.